Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.23, Biography Edition, Roger Williams. Just as last week, we stopped to focus on John Winthrop. This week, we are going to do the same for Roger Williams. It is a bit astonishing to me that we have barely even mentioned Williams to this point. However, I can pretty much promise you that from this point forward, he is going to be a major player for the rest of this season, as well as portions of next season. When it comes to the politics of New England over the next 50 years, Roger Williams is going to basically be there standing in the middle of it all. He is going to introduce truly radical ideas such as the separation of church and state. He is going to form the most democratic system in the colonies thus far. He is going to be staunchly opposed to slavery in a time where that's really not a thing quite yet. And oh yeah, he's also going to found the Rhode Island colony. For all of his efforts, Williams is going to do a great job of alienating everybody around him and generally becoming something of a pariah around New England. Despite that, however, Williams has absolutely earned his spot in the pantheon of founding fathers. Before we get going, I want to warn you that for the better part of 50 years, Williams is going to be one of the most important colonists there is, so this episode is going to go a bit longer than most. Just a heads up on that one. So, without any further ado, let's dive in and discuss Roger Williams. Little is really known about the early life of Roger Williams. He was born sometime around 1603 in London, however, nobody knows exactly when. The church with his birth records was destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666. In so many ways, I could copy and paste the section I wrote on John Winthrop's early life here, and it would be more or less correct. Like Winthrop, Williams had a middle-class upbringing. His father was a tailor and did well enough that the young Williams was able to get a good education. From a young age, Williams emerged as having a real talent in learning languages. This ability to learn languages is going to eventually play an important role in the life of Williams as he would produce the first ever Indian language dictionary. Likewise, later in his life, in exchange for lessons in Hebrew, Williams would tutor John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, in some of these Indian languages. Abilities as a polyglot aside, Williams would spend his teen years at Cambridge studying to enter the church. Initially, at least, Williams was moving in a direction of being a priest in the Anglican church. For Williams, it was a slow slide into his position as not only a leading Puritan, but also a leader amongst the group wanting full separation from the church. Williams had trained to be a priest in the Anglican church, yes, but while at Cambridge moved in a decidedly Puritan direction. It was not until the 1620s that he would move further and became a proponent of a full separation from that church. It was those same pressures that drove the Great Migration that would eventually push Williams in the direction of immigration to the North American English colonies. Just as Winthrop had been before him, increasing concern over the policies of Charles I and William Laud was enough to convince Williams that the time to get out of England was at hand. Boarding the Lion in December of 1630, Roger Williams was coming to America. Perhaps there was no greater talent that Williams possessed than the power to simply infuriate everybody who he came across. Upon arrival in Massachusetts, Williams would waste little time in getting everybody to hate his guts. The colony that Williams arrived in was largely the one that we spent the last episode discussing. It was a highly religious society that was running under the direction of John Winthrop. Williams spent his first several months in the colony living among the other prominent families in New England while he himself worked on getting on his feet in the new land. Williams was a highly coveted guest coming over and was immediately popular amongst the other settlers. He was so popular in Boston that when Pastor John Wilson made the announcement that he was going to return to England to get his family, it was Williams who they had turned to. The plan was that while Wilson was gone, Roger Williams would step in and be the pastor of the all-important church in Boston. When Wilson returned, it was unclear what they were going to do, but suffice it to say they would have found a place high in the church for Roger Williams, if not just leaving him as a second pastor. Okay, so this is a huge deal for Williams. In Massachusetts, there was no more important city than Boston. Within Boston, there was no more important institution and an institution more central to life than the church. Roger Williams was being offered a position running that most important of institutions. For Williams, this meant that almost immediately after arriving, he would have become one of the single most important and influential men in the entire colony. Anybody in their right mind would jump at a chance to instantly become one of the most powerful men in the colony, right? 
Williams, being a conscientious man, however, decided instead to ask some questions. Learn about the church in Boston. Which, I mean, come on, that's totally fair. He is looking at taking over the most powerful institution in Massachusetts. You need to ask a few questions on the job interview, right? Okay, so this is where he says thank you and accepts the job, right? No. No, this is actually the point where he says, oh yeah, I can't accept the job because this isn't a separatist church. If any of you guys want to know how to make enemies and alienate people in 1630s Boston, it is by refusing a position leading the most important church in North America because your beliefs are directly opposed to the established leadership of the city. We have already spent a ton of time talking about how the Puritans in Massachusetts were not separatists, and in fact were pretty staunchly opposed to such heretical thoughts. That Williams came in and not only declined their awesome offer, but then decided to go ahead and tell them that he disagrees with them on such a core subject was simply stunning. Not to mention, inside of Massachusetts, Williams had come in and was immediately a popular figure. Having him come out as a separatist was more than just infuriating, it was potentially dangerous. Instantly, Williams moved from being a coveted and highly sought after arrival to being a persona non grata. It would have been a lot to handle at this point, but Roger Williams is not a man to rest idly by. He was more than happy to express his grievances to the church in Massachusetts. Calvinists divined the Ten Commandments into what they referred to as the first and the second table. The first table were the commandments that dealt with the relationship between people and God. The second table are the commandments that address the relationship between people and other people. For example, commandments like have no God before me and don't take the Lord's name in vain are going to come out of that first table. The second table is going to have the commandments such as don't murder, don't steal, and respect your parents. For men like John Winthrop, it was the role of government to ensure that both the first and the second table were enforced and protected by the government. In the eyes of men like John Winthrop, it was the government's job to enforce the covenant between God and the people. Williams, however, disagrees with this premise. Well, Williams would agree that the second table should be enforced, because nobody really wants murderers and thieves running around. He believed that it exceeded the authority of the government to enforce the first table. Williams did not believe that the state should have anything to do with interpreting man's relationship with God, and this was an overstepping of their power. This idea the thought that the state lacked the power to enforce the first table is something that was radical for its time. This was radical in New England and would have been equally unthinkable back in Europe. While there may have been religious disagreements, pretty much all governments were on board with the idea that they had a responsibility to enforce the entirety of the Ten Commandments. Even the separatists still believed that the government had a role in enforcing that first table. Unfortunately, sources are thin on how Williams arrived to such a radical thought. His writings for the era have been lost, so we don't really get a glimpse at his thought process into the matter. Rather, we are left with just the end result. Regardless, however, this is an end result that is going to have momentous effect. In the moment, it is going to make Williams an outcast, somebody who needs to be treated carefully as he is espousing dangerously rebellious thoughts. In the long term, however, the separation of church and state is going to transform from a radical and dangerous idea to something ingrained in the very bedrock of the American political experience. This also marks the first time where those surrounding Williams will look at him and say, yeah, you probably should leave. For Roger Williams, it was time for him to look elsewhere. He was no longer welcome in Boston. Luckily for him, at that exact moment, the settlers up in Salem were more than happy to take him in. Salem looked thoroughly forward to sticking it to Boston. Keep in mind what it must have been like to have settled in Salem. Endicott had, after all, settled Salem first. When Winthrop and crew arrived, they looked around, decided that they hated the place, and moved further south to Charlestown first and eventually founded Boston. Salem had been the main colony of Massachusetts Bay, and then all of a sudden, it was a second-rate town. Williams was quick to relocate to Salem, where he was well-received at first. For Salem, this gave them a few chances. First, the brand new Christianity being practiced in Salem was more in line with Williams' belief. This isn't to say that they were separatists in Salem, however, they did practice a stricter form of Christianity that Williams could work with. Beyond that, and conveniently for Williams, the reverend in Salem had just died. Finally, this was a great chance for the settlers of Salem to take a dig at the settlers in Boston. 
I mean, they had stolen Williams away. They were feeling pretty good about themselves at this point. The problem is that in Boston, Winthrop and company were not amused. They had just, for all intents and purposes, run Williams out of town. Now, Salem had hired him without giving a thought to conferring with the company at large. This isn't a minor point either. Keep in mind that Salem was a town in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It's not like this is a separate entity with a separate government. All those dangers that they had worried about in Boston still existed in Boston. Allowing Williams to set up just 20 miles north of Salem? That's just not going to work out. In response to this, on April 12, 1631, the Court of Assistants, as well as the governor, met in Boston to discuss the issue. Interestingly enough, Boston was very well represented during this hearing. The lone representative from Salem, John Endicott, wasn't there. Now, I admittedly can't find a clear reason why Endicott wasn't there, so I can't say if this is a deal where he decided not to go out of protest, decided not to attend for some practical reason, or if his invitation had got lost in the mail. But either way, Salem, the city at the center of all this, was not represented at the gathering. The assistants ended up sending a letter off to Endicott asking him what they were thinking and why they thought it was okay to hire Williams without even consulting the leadership in Boston. Throughout this discourse, it's not like Boston forbade Salem to move forward with Williams. More so, they wrote a strongly worded letter that basically told them that they needed to think really, really hard if this move was in their best interest. In a convenient little twist, and I'm sure much to the delight of the magistrates back in Boston, Endicott himself was currently facing assault charges at this time. The assistants did not hesitate to remind Endicott that he would soon be sitting for trial in his own case in the same remonstrance that they had sent regarding Williams. Be it for personal reasons for Endicott, giving into pressure in the greater Massachusetts Bay Colony, or some other more practical reason, Salem did come around and rescinded their offer. Out of work and not really welcome anywhere in the Massachusetts Bay Colony anymore, Williams found himself at something of a crossroads. He had come over a highly sought-after teacher. He was popular and everybody was anxious to get him working for them. However, his religious beliefs had very quickly turned him into an outcast, who the colonial leaders viewed as dangerous. So what do you do if you're a separatist in New England in the 1630s? That's right! Roger Williams is going to pack up things and move the show to Plymouth. Plymouth, in so many ways, seems like a logical landing spot for Williams. After all, the settlers in Plymouth were separatists. They had no problem with the policies of Williams. In fact, they were much closer aligned to his beliefs than anybody else. It is important to note that this still is not a perfect fit. After all, the idea of separation of church and state isn't totally accepted anywhere in the 1630s. Bradford and company would not have been on board with the separation of church and state. We have seen when we went through Plymouth that, in fact, they very tightly tied church to state. And beyond that, Bradford and the other people in Plymouth were going to want to enforce both the first and the second table. They had no interest in that part of what Williams was preaching. But hey, if nothing else, we are at least getting closer. Upon arrival in Plymouth, Williams decided to take a more laid-back approach. Instead of jumping right into the fray like he had in Massachusetts, Williams was more interested in settling down and establishing some roots. This means that he did not seek out to become the reverend of the church, nor did he seek out a particularly key role in the administration of local politics. Instead, Williams just wanted to blend in. William Bradford would write of Roger Williams that, Mr. Roger Williams, a man godly and zealous, having many precious parts but very unsettled in judgment came over first to Massachusetts, but upon some discontent left that place and came hither. Why he was friendly entertained, according to their poor ability, and exercised his gifts amongst them. And after some time was admitted a member of the church and his teachings well approved for the benefit whereof I still bless God. And I am thankful to him, even for his sharpest admonishments and rebuffs, so far as they agree with the truth." William's role in the colony may best be proved not only by what Bradford says, but by the fact that Williams really doesn't feature prominently in Bradford's writings. By all rights, Williams settled in nicely. Even his relationship with Winthrop appears to have improved during this period, probably because stuck out in Plymouth, Williams wasn't really a risk to anybody. While in Plymouth, Williams was also free initially to indulge another fascination of his, the Native Americans. As we discussed at the opening today, Williams was a bit of a polyglot. 
One of the stated goals of basically everybody who had ever come to the Americas was to convert the local population to Christianity. Spreading religion had been the justification that everybody used, even if in all reality it was typically more lip service than actual practice. Roger Williams, however, wasn't really a lip service kind of guy and actually did have interest in trying to convert the local populations. This would lead Williams on a path where he would do his best to learn the native language and would eventually see him produce the first dictionary of Indian terms. More problematically, it introduced Williams to concerns about land rights of the Indians. Here was the problem. Williams looked around and began to question how the English had come to acquire all of their land. As a reminder, the way it would work is that the king would grant a charter and the settlers would go off and see their new homes. This troubled Williams. After all, the lands weren't empty at all. The Indians had been using the land. These questions made Williams ask the question regarding the legitimacy of the English claims. Now, this wasn't a totally novel idea. However, the difference is the justifications. This had actually come up before. If you recall, those heading to Plymouth had justified taking the land on the basis that the Indians weren't properly developing it and therefore had no legal claim. It had been dubious at the time. However, for the people coming to settle, it was a self-serving thing that they all felt that they basically had to do. The problem is that for Roger Williams, he was not about to turn a blind eye to this. The ramifications of this idea are stunning. Williams wasn't just bringing up a novel argument. He was directly challenging the authority of the king to grant these charters in the first place. Williams brought his concern back to Plymouth. The leaders in Plymouth told him to write a treatise on it, defending his point of view, and that is just what Williams set out to do. The problem here is that Williams really went for it. Unfortunately, the writing is now lost because ultimately Williams would voluntarily agree to burn it. However, what was in it appears to have been explosive. What Roger Williams appears to have written was a direct assault on the monarchy's claim to the new world. Williams called the king a liar and directly challenged his authority to make these land grants. This was over-the-top radical and nobody wanted anything to do with it. Plymouth had always been a hotbed of dissension, yes, these guys were separatists who were facing not only the threat of persecution, but some members of their group were actively being sought by the authorities. Yet, even in this society, this is just going too far. William Bradford wrote that Williams had come up with some very strange opinions that caused considerable strife between him and the church. William Bradford goes on to describe Williams asking to be released as a member of the Plymouth Church, being granted that request, and leaving Plymouth to return to Salem. Interestingly enough, Bradford writes that he thought it was prudent to send a warning along about these new positions of Williams. This goes to show that in Plymouth, they clearly understood the nature of what was being said, and it seems had an idea of just what a powder keg Williams had chosen to go preach. Williams returned to Salem, where he took up the teaching job that he had wanted years before. However, by this point, the general court in Boston had become aware of what Williams was preaching. For Winthrop and the others, this was not just deeply concerning, it was seditious and dangerous. Williams had shown himself to be a separatist who believed in the separation of church and state and now was directly calling out the monarchy. The last thing that these men wanted was to get England looking more closely at what they were doing and now Williams was calling out the king. He was calling him a liar. Williams, for his part, also appears to know that he had gone too far. When confronted by the leaders of the Bay Colony, Williams apparently acquiesced to the demands and himself agreed to burn his work. It is unclear why there was such a sudden change in heart by Roger Williams. However, it is certainly possible that he had just realized how dangerous his positions were and what a powder cake he was sitting on. Williams was no more anxious to attract the attention of the monarchy or William Law than anybody else. At this point, Williams' writings had just been viewed by the leadership within the colony. By burning the treatise, there really was nothing to prove its existence or his extreme views. Nothing that Williams believed or had preached in this regard was public. It was all contained within that treatise. So, hey, all is still good, right? Well, the immediate risk, for the most part, was mollified. It was abundantly clear to those in charge that Roger Williams was a threat and that he needed to go. Williams did not wait long to give them a reason to go after him. 
Williams, now the acting pastor in Salem, began to take issue with the civic oath required by the government. This oath had all males over 16 swearing the allegiance to the king in the colony, and included the words, so help me God. Williams took all kinds of problems with this. He was upset over the government requiring such an oath in the first place. He took issue with the wording, so help me God. In his view, the word so help me God made the oath another example of the colony trying to force a religious position. Williams continued to agitate and preach his disapproval to the church in Salem. Seeing an opportunity, the general court in Boston acted and formally called Williams before the court on July 8, 1635, warning Williams that he was again preaching dangerous ideas. However, we had been down this road before, and this time Williams had no plan to back down. In fact, he decided to entrench. The court gave Williams one of two options. He could recant his position and they would allow him to stay, or it was going to be exile. I think this really goes to the power of Williams. Even after all of this, the colonial leaders in Massachusetts still wanted to find some way to keep Roger Williams in the colony. This time, however, Williams isn't going to change his mind, so once again, more officially this time, the leaders in Massachusetts tell Williams, yeah, it's time that you leave. The leadership in Boston did attempt to give Williams some time to get his affairs together, so long as he stopped preaching his troubling thoughts. They were going to give him at least six weeks before they exiled him into the wilderness. However, Williams couldn't do that. And sure enough, the decision was made that the colony could not afford Williams any extra time. Williams had learned that they were coming to execute the order against him, and he, as well as several of his followers, slipped out of town. The good news for Williams is that he had become very popular amongst the Indians. As he had been kicked out of town during the winter, his prospects were initially looking pretty poor. Williams, however, was able to get some help from our old friend, Massasoit. After wandering around for about four months, Williams had moved 50 miles south of Boston. There, off an outcropping of Narragansett Bay in June 1636, Roger Williams founded Providence, Rhode Island. For Williams, Providence was going to provide him with a series of new challenges. Williams had always been admittedly concerned with the matters of the immortal soul, far more than he had been involved in any kind of practical governance. In an interesting twist, it was John Winthrop that Williams would write to during the summer of 1636, basically asking, hey, how does this whole government thing work? One of the things to keep in mind here is that Providence had no authorization to even exist at this point. There is no charter from the king, there is no board of governors or any kind of oversight. This is very literally Roger Williams out in the middle of nowhere with followers just faking it until they make it. Williams writes to Winthrop saying that the head of the families of the new settlement meet every two weeks to discuss the basics like the common peace, watch, and planting. The most immediate concerns for Williams was in the area of food production and protection from the local Pequot tribe. While Williams historically kept exceedingly good relationships with the Indians, the Pequot tribe was in a bad way. And spoiler alert, but in just a few episodes from now, we are going to have an episode called the Pequot War. So yeah, things are going downhill there pretty quickly. Williams went with a very simple form of government, having all the families sign a covenant to link them together. Decisions were made by a majority vote, and the town would elect a town officer whose job was to run the government apparatus. Of course, the much more paramount importance for Williams was going to be establishing a church. True to his beliefs, Williams was careful to create a church that was fully separate from government. Williams preached separation of church and state and was going to make sure that his church was founded with that ideal in mind. Through some evolution, Williams had just founded what is going to become the basis of the Baptist Church in America. It is worth pointing out that Williams himself was never really a devout Baptist, despite helping form their church. What Williams believed was that the perfect church was only going to be possible upon Christ's return to earth. However, because that hadn't happened yet, the Baptist Church was the best and the most logical existing form. So, while Williams didn't view the Baptist Church as being the final end goal church, it was the best they had, so that is what he would go with. Rhode Island earned a somewhat special spot, therefore, in early colonial America. It became a colony where the outcasts went. 
mostly made up of religious outcasts. However, as we are going to see, when people's views don't fall in line with the set goals down in Massachusetts, it is typically Rhode Island that they turn to. This is largely because of that separation of church and state. In Providence, you weren't required to be a Baptist. You weren't required to believe in God at all. Nobody was going to come and arrest you or fine you because you bailed on Sunday service. Church and state were truly separate entities. It is around the same time that we see other towns begin to sprout up around Rhode Island. In addition to Providence, the towns of Newport, Portsmouth, and Warwick joined in. Providence, Newport, and Portsmouth all worked together and formed a kind of provincial governance over the greater colony. Warwick, on the other hand, under the leadership of Samuel Groton, would be different altogether. Well, the other three colonies did their best to work together and create something better than they had left back in Massachusetts, Groton came in and did just about everything he could to disrupt those efforts. Arriving in Rhode Island in 1641, Groton was a problem from the start. The problem with Groton is that he questioned basically any and all authority. No worries about any kind of separation of church and state here. Groton questioned both. Most problematically, Groton was not being quiet in his criticisms. Now, it is William's turn to pretend to be John Winthrop. Well, Williams was pretty happy with dissenters. Groton was just too much for him to handle. As Groton made his way throughout the colony, he found that over and over again he was getting icy welcomes, mostly because he would wander into towns and immediately start objecting to the systems of government in that town. That is to say nothing for the fact that he basically had a problem with all accepted religious tenets as well. Williams was okay with people having different viewpoints, but Groton, he was exhausting. Despite problems with Groton, Williams had come around to the fact that Rhode Island, while awesome, wasn't exactly operating with any kind of authority. Williams recognized that for the sake of domestic tranquility, it was going to be important to get a charter and actually have a level of legitimacy. Williams decided in 1643 that it was a good time to go ahead and get this done. You might be saying to yourself, hey, I thought Williams got to Rhode Island in 1636. Why did he decide to wait seven years to get a charter and hence make his colony legitimate? A big reason is that political events were going on in England that had been dicey at best. However, by the time 1643 rolled around, the timing was right. The king's personal rule was over and in fact Parliament was now engaged in the English Civil War. William Laud was now a guest in the Tower of London and there were friendly ears in London to request a charter from. The bigger problem is that everywhere Williams looked, another group was trying to take a piece of his claim. After all, Williams to this point had been operating without a charter. It's not like there was a royal decree that this was his land. Plymouth, Massachusetts, and even the new colony of Connecticut were making claims on his Rhode Island territory. So needing to secure his colony, Williams set out in 1643 to get that charter. A charter would make the colony legitimate and would put a stop to attacks on its borders. It would also be a way for Williams to make his religious policies not some experiment, but rather something more official. We are going to talk more about the effect of the English Civil War in New England next time when we turn our attention to the political affairs both at home and abroad. But suffice it to say for now that by this time in 1643, the Puritans in Parliament were in a pretty decent spot. Unable to travel directly through Massachusetts, because you know he was still banned, Williams first made his way through the Dutch colony of the New Netherlands, just in time to see the Kieft War break out, named after the colonial governor, William Kieft. Williams had made an offer to the Dutch to mediate, but they rebuffed him. The war was going to be quick and easy after all. Why would they want to mediate a peace before they had achieved the superior position? The Dutch thought they would have everything wrapped up nicely in just a few days' time. As is the case so many times throughout history, fast and easy wars have a nasty habit of being anything but. The Dutch were thoroughly routed by the Indians, who started doing annoying things like burning their towns and slaughtering all of the settlers in the countryside that they now completely controlled. Now, hanging out in a poorly defended colony with Indians approaching and lighting everything in their path on fire, the Dutch decided that, yeah, maybe we should let Williams go ahead and deal with this. Williams would step up and ended up becoming a mediator for this conflict, whereby he was able to bring something of a peace to the region. This is all reported by John Winthrop, who in this instance gives exactly no details on how Williams accomplished anything. With this problem behind him, Williams was now able to make his way to England to secure that charter. 
things don't get off to a wonderful start for Roger Williams back in England. Once arriving, he learns that all of New England, meaning Massachusetts, Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven, had joined in an alliance known as the United Alliance, which was meant to bind the New England colonies together for the common defense. If you notice that I did not mention Rhode Island in that list, you are correct, they were not invited to play along. So, for Williams, he is now trying to obtain a charter after just learning that his colony is now an isolated island in New England, which, of course, is not going to be super helpful for him. The second problem came that, while England was a much friendlier place to him in 1643 than it would have been a decade before, Parliament wasn't all that interested in his plight, nor was it clear that they had the authority to do anything about it. Right at this time, Parliament was busy fighting a civil war and probably hoping that the end result didn't end up with them all being beheaded. The colonies in New England were of such little importance that Parliament never really even bothered to claim dominion over them. Certainly, they were not interested in taking a break from the war efforts to listen to such a minor issue like the corporate charters and things like that. Those things could wait till the fighting was done. Eventually, Parliament would come around and establish the Committee of Foreign Plantations. The Earl of Warwick was made the Governor-in-Chief, so at least Williams had a place to go. Just because nothing can ever possibly go that easily, Thomas Weld had little interest in allowing Williams this victory. Who is Thomas Weld? Thomas Weld had served as the minister of a church in Roxbury, Massachusetts. He was staunchly opposed to the heretical teaching of Williams, and the last thing he wanted to do was see Williams get any kind of a foothold in New England. Weld would later become a key figure in helping establish the first university in New England, which he would name Harvard. Having returned to England, Weld wasted exactly zero time after the Committee of Foreign Plantations was created to claim the majority of Rhode Island for Massachusetts. Weld, doing this under basically his own authority, sought the signatures of the committee members for this claim. Weld then, through some creative dating, made it appear that the charter, which will become the Narragansett patent, had been granted. However, despite an attempt to pass it off, the document never had been voted on, therefore the charter didn't exist yet. The document wasn't exactly a forgery, the signatures on it were all real, but the effect was the same and the charter was invalid. As Williams was waiting around for Parliament to address the existence of the colony, and then while Thomas Well tried to steal away Rhode Island, Williams kept himself busy. What Williams had been doing during that time was writing a pamphlet called Mr. Cotton's Letter, Examine and Answered. Now, we haven't talked much about John Cotton, but he has been lying under the surface all throughout today. Cotton had been one of the principal people against Williams and his ideas of religious freedom. In England, there had been a building fight between the Presbyterians and the Independents. This fight is very similar to what is going on in New England, where theologically there was an agreement on doctrine. However, there was a disagreement over the role of that church in the state. The independents were basically that same group that existed in Massachusetts and were led by men like Cotton and Winthrop, whereas the Presbyterians would have been sympathetic to the plight of men like Williams. Conveniently for Williams, during this fight, it was the independents that came away looking petty, whereas the Presbyterians looked like those just trying to do their own thing. This is an important distinction, especially when you consider that the independents were essentially analogous to the Puritans in Massachusetts, and the Presbyterians were analogous to Roger Williams and his new Baptist church. In other words, Massachusetts doesn't come away looking good here. In fact, Massachusetts comes away looking overbearing and in need of a check on their power. If anything, they appear to be a colony that is acting with a disturbing amount of arbitrary authority. And hey, that Thomas Well guy who had been looking to have Massachusetts steal away Rhode Island? Yeah, maybe this would be a nice chuck on power. After all, nobody wants to let those jerks in Massachusetts just push everybody around and get their way. For the independents in London who had been seeking toleration from the Presbyterians, this entire episode looked terrible for them. Look at what happens when you give them an inch, as was happening in Massachusetts. All of this was enough to stop any continuing efforts by Thomas Weld. On March 14, 1644, Rhode Island became a legitimate colony and received its charter. So, now it's the end of the 1640s, Williams has his charter, he is going to sit back and retire, right? If you think that is the case, you really have not been paying much attention today. 
Williams would spend much of the rest of his life further working towards the growth and development of the Providence colony. Williams would spend a great deal of his time pushing back against the growing influence of the Quakers, a group that he personally couldn't stand. Williams would emerge during the 1660s as an early opponent of slavery. Eventually, this manifests as Williams passing a law against slavery. While the law did allow for the continuation of indentured servitude, it placed a 10-year time limit on any kind of service of that nature. Now, in full disclosure, this new law isn't going to be nearly as effective as I'm sure Williams would have wanted. However, it still says something that he pushed for it. Williams' views of slavery stemmed out of his religious beliefs and his belief that all souls were created equal in front of God. This wasn't a novel concept, but for Williams to use it as a justification to make slavery illegal, that is a pretty big deal. Williams would see his final fight come during King Philip's War. The war set several of the tribes of New England at war against the English. Williams had done all he could to prevent the war, but ultimately he was unable to. We are going to spend a lot of time over the next season talking about King Philip's War, so I'm not going to go into all the details now. However, suffice it to say that this war was a deeply painful one for him. Williams has spent so much of his life carefully cultivating close relationships with the Native Americans. He was well-liked by them, and most importantly, he was trusted by them. Here, however, Williams was left with little choice and took up arms. Beyond the sadness of taking up arms against the Indians, Providence itself was destroyed on March 29, 1676, when the town was burned to the ground. Only a handful of the town's buildings survived the fire. Among the buildings destroyed was Roger Williams' own home. By the time the war was over, Williams was left poor, older, and weaker, and he was at this time approaching the end of his life. After spending over 50 years in America and having introduced ideas that would fundamentally change what it means to be an American, Roger Williams died at the age of 79, sometime during the winter of 1683. I want to finish today by discussing the final legacy of Roger Williams. And I mean, where do we even start? Separation of church and state, Rhode Island, his relationship towards the Native Americans, his opposition to slavery, his role in the foundation of the Baptist church. There is no way around it. Roger Williams was an important guy. It can be difficult to look at a man like Williams and figure out what his specific contribution is. However, in many ways, I see him as a check to John Winthrop and his vision of America. I admittedly hesitated before writing that because I worried that it is going to give the wrong idea. Williams and Winthrop are both absolutely critical to laying out the foundation of what will eventually be seen as critical to the American political experience, though both men got there in very different ways. With this all being said, though, I do want to stop short of calling Roger Williams a product of the Enlightenment. In much the same way that I was unwilling to say that about Winthrop, Williams is also going to fall short of the coming wave of Enlightened thinking that we begin to see emerge in the second half of the 17th century. What Winthrop and Williams, however, do show is the battle that will emerge and, in many ways, continues on between the question of religion and politics. The place of religion specifically here Christianity, not only in society, but its interplay with the political systems of the future United States is going to remain a theme that we are going to be looking at constantly throughout the course of this podcast. When we reach our conversation on the First Amendment, I'm going to refer back to these episodes because this is the origin of that debate in America. This is to say nothing of William's role in founding Rhode Island establishing the Baptist Church, and his views towards the Native Americans, which really set him apart during this time. In this way, Williams does leave a lasting imprint on the United States today, despite being an often forgotten figure. This raises an issue with the idea of our founding fathers in general, because it locks events down to a very specific time, and doesn't consider the foundations that they are standing on. Jefferson, Adams and Madison are in a lot of ways standing on a foundation that Roger Williams helped lay. As we will all see as our story moves back to the narrative, Williams is going to remain a central figure throughout the rest of this season. Next time, we are going to start a series of episodes looking at the major topics within the early New England colonial structure. This is going to include questions of religion, politics, as well as the colony's ongoing relationship with England during what was a very turbulent time for the mother country. 
Before we can do any of that, however, I want to spend the next episode introducing the other colonies in New England, and I'm going to bring the New Netherlands into the game as well. As the fate of all these colonies is going to be ultimately so interlinked, I think a proper introduction is finally in order. With that, I will see you back here in two weeks' time as we begin to look at the other New England colonies. <laughs>